This is episode number 47 with Eric Francis, our first returning guest to the Neuroscience Meet Social Emotional Learning podcast. Eric was just with us for episode 41 on how to use questions to promote cognitive rigor, thinking and learning with his book, Now That's a Good Question. And because of these strange times we're in right now, I thought it would be perfect timing to ask Eric back to share his thoughts on how to transition from teaching and learning in the classroom to teaching and learning at home. Welcome back, Eric. Thanks, Andrea. And thanks for the opportunity to being on the show and uh, being able to talk to your, uh, your audience and hopefully anyone else will be listening out there. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for your willingness to do this, especially on a weekend. And we can all benefit from hearing your thoughts of what exactly you're doing to ensure that your girls are still learning while schools have been canceled for longer than we all could have anticipated here. So what are you doing, Eric, with your girls, their middle school and high school age to ensure that they're still learning without stressing everybody out over there? Well, I think that's the key word, stressing everybody out, because um, probably as a lot of people, when we first um, start to experience the, the current events that are going on right now, we were wondering, okay, how does learning never stop? How do we make sure that the learning continues in the home? So one of the things I proposed with my kids was that I told them that this is not going to be an extended vacation or break, that learning will continue. And I told them that you have four core subjects that you basically focus on in school. And that's English language arts or language arts, which is reading and writing, speaking, listening, and language. Uh, you have math, you have science, you have social studies. I said, that's the four core content areas. Now, what I also told them, I said, you guys get to choose what you want to study in those core content areas. It's kind of going back to the whole... Um, open classroom idea back in the 60s, which was much more flexible, it was much more student-centered, it was much more about addressing what students felt like they needed and what they want to learn. So I told them, I said, okay, here are the four content areas and uh, core content areas, and you guys get to choose the topics. So for example, for my high schooler, I said, look, you're studying American literature and English language arts. You can do one or two things. One, you can pick a book that's American, the example of a letter, American literature and read that. Or if there's an author you read in school, uh, you can choose another story that was written by them or another book that was written by them and do a compare and contrast. I was really careful about that because when school did come back in the session before the end of the year, I didn't want her to read something that's on the, uh, the list in terms of uh, the reading list in terms of her class. I didn't want to go back to say, well, I already read this at home. So I'm trying to extend her a little bit. Um, my youngest, who's not much of a reader, um, she doesn't like to read, but that doesn't mean that we have to stop using those kind of, the kind of instruction we have for English language arts. It's about reading text or it's about responding to text as well. So, I mean, you can use video, you can use audio. So I told her, I said, you want to binge watch Grey's Anatomy, which is her latest thing, or binge watch Friends, that's fine. You're going to summarize every um, episode that you watch and basically you're going to, we're going to talk about central ideas. We're going to talk about, you know, the effect of the show, how they use different conventions with it. Math. I told them that if there was a subject area that they were struggling with in math, we can spend some time to work on it together. Um, science. I told them to pick a topic in science, history and social studies again, the same thing. And, you know, since I'm an educator, what I was going to do is I was going to relate it back to one of the standards to make sure that's still focused. And I know that sounds intimidating and maybe it does for non-educators out there, but really it allows for more of a flexible experience. I mean, we know what the kids are studying in school. And when I talk about, you know, art or music or physical education with the kids, well, that's what we're going to do as a family because we're going to go outside and we're going to play sports. We're going to ride our bikes. We're going to do things like that. We're going to maybe do some art. We like to do port painting. Uh, music, listen to music in the house, talk about music. I, I'm a music aficionado. Um, but really, the thing people need to understand if you're not an educator, and this is to the parents, you're not a teacher, okay? What I mean by that is that we teachers have you know extensive training. Um, 
not only, you know, in terms of, you know, how to develop and deliver instruction, but also, you know, different ways we can work with pedagogy and everything. You're a parent, you're a different type of teacher. You can teach them through experiences. And that's what I'm hoping our parents will hear out there in this is that how can you create a learning experience for your children that's not only educational, but it's also engaging and enjoyable. There's nothing wrong with that. And maybe you have fun with it as well. Um, you know, you be creative with the lessons. Think about your favorite lesson back in school. Think about your favorite topic back in school. Did they address it? Did they, you know, go delve deeper into it? Is there an area that you have some expertise in? You know, not so much teach your kids, but, you know, engage with your kids, you know, get them interested, try to find the connections, make them excited about learning. Because this is the secret about teaching. If you're excited about what you're teaching, your students will be excited as well. Well, I love that, Eric. I've been doing a little bit of reading with my eight-year-old that doesn't like reading either. And I never thought about picking something that she was interested in, like a show, like she's all into Rebecca Zamora or whatever from YouTube. And so I never thought about asking her to summarize what she's learning from something she's interested in. I'm normally just grabbing her textbooks that are online, reading it with her and asking her to summarize it, which is boring. It's not as exciting as what you've suggested here. So I, I really like that idea. I'm going to take away some of that and try to add that in to make it more enjoyable And because I could be almost like a drill sergeant over here and it's, it's not fun for them. And that's what we got to be careful about. Um, you know, we, our students, you know, the way a lot of us learned back in the day, very traditional instruction, very much a top down teacher led wrote, um, you know, do it this way. There's only one way to do it. Um, one of the things I want parents to recognize and realize about this is that we live in a world where answers come free. Okay. Basically, you can pick up this and do, you know, find all the answers you want when it comes to everything you need to learn. I mean, Google, you know, they, they, we kind of say in education, and it's wrong for us teachers to say this, that if you can Google the answer, it's not a good question. That's not true. You know, Google's a way of life. Um, there's a lot of great resources out there. There's a lot, and I've been trying to share those on social media. A bunch of us teachers are on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and uh, LinkedIn. We're trying to give people as many resources as possible. But the great thing about it is that, you know, even in the classroom, we're restricted when it comes to teaching and learning because we have certain standards we have to meet. And we got to make sure we get all that done uh, by the assessment, which is happens this time of year, which now have all been um, alleviated, that, that, that obligation has been alleviated but thanks to the federal government. Um, this is really a time where you really can delve deeper into it and, and really be very flexible when it comes to what the kids are learning. You know, that basically we talk about math. There's more than one way to do math these days. And it's not common core math, okay? That's, that's a myth, all right? We, we treat it like a Bigfoot or Loch Ness monster. It's actually a unicorn. You know, what you're doing is there's more than one way to do math these days. And you can ask your kids, okay, well, how do you understand it? And that's really what basically, you know, again, with that engagement, like, you know, a lot of us learn traditional, for example, with multiplication, stacking your factors. You know, our, there's a joke out there. All our kids are learning what it means to carry the one. Well, that's the way we did it. If we can have our kids do it their way and show us, again, that's that engagement. That's that engaging conversation. Or if you Google, what are the different ways to add? What are the different ways to subtract? What are the different ways to multiply? What are the different ways to divide? You know, I do that when I'm planning my lessons and I try to find all these different ways that kids can understand. And there's some ways I can teach them and there's some ways I can't. If I can't teach them, then what I do is I show them an instructional video and I ask them, okay, how many of you see that? And a lot of the kids will raise their hands if they, if they see it. And I go, can you explain it to me? That's learning, okay? Because that's the thing is that if they can not just show you, but tell you, that's real authentic learning. It's not about how many questions they can answer correctly. It's not about how many problems they can solve accurate, uh, correct, uh, successfully, or it's not how many tasks they can uh, complete uh, successfully. It's 
can they demonstrate and communicate what they did? This is a time where we need to have the students not just receive the information but and, and, and learn the procedures, but relay it back and, and think and, and communicate what they can do with it and, and think deeply, think creatively. I mean, th th this is such a time where we can basically let, you know, the hard times and the depression get us down, or we can really, really try to think about how can we be creative about it. And that's every great generation who goes through some sort of um, social tragedy or social uh, hardship, you know, and the outcome, we, some of the greatest changes in society happens. And is there a way we can do that and kind of instill this sense of hope in our kids and really engage them? And it's not something that basically we have to, you know, force upon them. They're already exposed to it with their media. I mean, this whole thing with, you know, the way the virus is spreading and everything, you know, their fiction now became fact. I mean, I, 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 I you know, kind of, you know, in a, in a lighthearted way, what I say is, you know, we need to be able to be worried because of Caesar and the apes, uh, you know, rise to power. Because if you watch the end of the new Rise of Planet of the Apes, that's how the apes rose to power is that it was a virus that basically got spread and then, you know, reduced the human population. That's when the apes all rose, which is where the virus came from. But that's where our great creativity comes from. So our kids, they should be thinking critically, making the connections, thinking creatively. Okay, here's some great stories I can go and come up with and really, really engaging themselves instead of just succumbing to all the bad news and everything that's happening out there. Exactly. Exactly. I love that. And I saw a great post for, from Learning A to Z. They're an educational company that does um, the RAS Early Readers because I've been trying to get an idea of what this looks like in our house. And I'm going to post a link to that article because they gave some great ideas and resources. But I just wonder, as you're doing this, what does your day look like? So how have you added this new way of learning into your life? And are you keeping your usual daily routine from before in this new way? Trying to, um, it's, it's hard because, you know, what I do for a living, much like you is provide professional development support to schools and teachers. Well, with all the schools closed, um, and all the travel restrictions, I just read that they're not allowing flights into New York. Um, basically, you know, I have to be innovative and inventive and I have to think about ways to, um, you know, keep my brain not only just active, but also healthy you know, because it's easy to basically succumb to a lot of the bad news uh, and, and, and the depression that comes with it. So, you know, kind of trying to like keep myself focused and motivated. A lot of that has helped me. Uh, a lot of that in terms of how I'm managing myself is because I'm already, you know, self-employed and I know how to structure myself to say, you know, when it's, I, I can Netflix all day, you know, for life with the way my work is, but I have to get up. I have to and if I don't have a job, I got to create a job or find it. So I'm trying to like make people, you know, connect with people, um, you know, offering a lot of my services pro bono right now. I don't feel comfortable charging right now, helping teachers, helping parents, because you don't want to profiteer off, off uh, a pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of what I'm doing is going on social media, telling parents, hey, I'm an educator, 20 years experience. I've taught all the subject areas. I'm also an education author. I train teachers. If you need help or support, you know, please reach out to me. Um, even my colleagues or friends, you know, if you need anything, give me a buzz. You know, trying to find an online platform, you know, to where I can go and and service not only schools but also students. But from a personal standpoint, like everyone else, you know, I went into, you know automatic drive when it came to teaching with the kids, the way I kind of explained that thing to you about how I wanted to set up the school. But I backed off a little bit because my kids have to also adjust for the changes that are happening. I mean, I don't want to just hit them with all of a sudden, this is another big change, how school is. So I'm kind of trying to ease them into it. This is kind of their uh, their week break, where basically I'm trying to ease them and create a routine for them, get them stimulated. Um, I broke down and bought an Xbox One, but we bought Madden Football and we bought uh, The Sims. So they're not just you know passively doing things; we're actively doing things. My daughter and I will play Madden Football together. Um, we, you know, she's on this. My both my daughters are on The Sims. 
you know, actively engaged. We're setting the time limit. You know, we're watching television together. We're having dinner together. We are, you know, talking, you know, we're, we're trying to talk from a historical standpoint of things. I think we just kind of need to relax and reassess. And I, I understand we got to get these kids busy. You got to get it. Slow down. Okay. Don't put pressure on yourself. That's something I had to learn because I was like, oh my gosh, I got to do this. I got to find out how I'm going to work. We all need to slow down. And we all need to basically take a moment just to stop and think and reassess. We do have that luxury of time and we need to take it. Our brains need that. Right. Exactly. It's so true. And looking at different activities, I saw a post that you did and Greg Wolcott, he put something up about websites that you can go for read alouds and other activities. And I pulled this resource up, but I wasn't sure exactly what it was. Do you remember that resource? And well, I'll tell you, a bunch of us have been sending out a bunch of things. I've been sending out a lot of resources about reading where books are being available for free. I put out resources out there that celebrities are out there um, reading to people on video. They're basically going out there and, 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 and really, you know, they're, they're, if you look at Jimmy uh, Fallon, he's doing his, uh, um, his show from home and, and doing a lot of engaging things. I apologize. It's not off the top of my head. But that's actually a big resource out there is that that's what you need to do is look at social media, especially at teacher friends, because what we're all doing is we're putting our resources out there. We're giving them, you know, available, you know, resource in terms of uh, online um, Zoom has become free for educators so we can talk to each other. Uh, Vimeo as well. There's uh, it, I believe um, Audible now is is free and it's OK to listen to the book as well as read it. Um, there's tons of different mass sites out there. Really, your ally is going to is going to be um, things like YouTube, things like uh, you know online different online platforms because you can just type in there how to do something. Khan Academy, and and our kids are used to learning this way. We adults were not. We're used to having a brick and mortar setting, a, a, an interpersonal face-to-face -face interaction with our teacher. But our kids are used to teaching when it comes to uh, video, when it comes to uh, basically ha having the video presented to them and react and respond to it. We just got to make sure they're doing it actively. Got it. Got it. So thinking back to your depth of knowledge, how would you tie that in to making learning enjoyable instead of just you know, this, this thing that we're doing now, like this academic time I've been calling it. I'm trying to ease up a little bit over here. So how are you doing it over there to trick the kids into learning something fun? It's it's making it engaging and enjoyable experiences. It's it's really, you know, definitely is a technical term we use as teachers. And I don't want, and I'm trying to figure out a way to do it that parents won't feel intimidated by it. Um, or put off by it because it's teacher talk. And even, you know, with depth of knowledge, we teachers don't really even understand it very clearly as well because we've been given so much misinformation about it. So let's describe this as levels of teaching, okay? Let's call this four different levels, four different ways kids can demonstrate their learning. So at a level one, all we want the kids to do is recall and restate and reproduce information procedures. The emphasis is on the answer. Can they answer correctly? They don't have to explain it. They don't have to interpret it. They don't have to justify it. Just can they do this correctly? And can they just present the correct answer for us? Think of a game show, okay? Think of Jeopardy. Think of who wants to be a millionaire. Parents, teachers, you're the host. You're the game show host. You are presenting information. You are asking questions. The goal of the kids is to answer correctly. You can do this by even taking board games and having them go around a board game. They land on something. Okay, here's a math question. Boom. Um, you can do this. There's a lot of online PowerPoints out there that actually mirror uh, game shows out there. Like you can make your own Jeopardy game with the subject area and, you know, just say this is a statement and, and have the kids respond back in a question. It's really like teaching like a, a quiz show. Mm -hmm. The second level is the kids have to not only demonstrate but also communicate how and why they can use what they're learning let's think about diy shows 
uh, do-it-yourself shows or learning shows. Let's think about Bob Ross, Joy of Painting. Let's think about 30-Minute Reels with Rachel Ray. Let's think about um, the different shows on HGTV. You have these hosts up there and they're explaining to you how they do something. If you turn the sound down, that would be a level one because they're just doing it, like the Nike slogan. But if you have them go on there and explain, this is how you do it, this is what you do, here's the first step, here's the second step, the student becomes the teacher. And that's what we can have our kids do. Our kids can do this because in a way to do it for fun is maybe, you know, if, if you don't have, you know, technology in your house, maybe have the kids, you know, demonstrate to everybody how they could do something. The kids teach everybody how to do something. But a lot of our kids are digital natives and have access to it. So they're all making TikTok videos. Trust me, if you go out there, they're all doing the silly dances and everything right now. Mm -hmm. Why don't you have them do something constructive? Why don't you have them make a TikTok video on how to do something, how to... Uh, solve a math problem or how to use the math or make a, a YouTube video about um, a book that they read and about how the author does it. Have them use their skills and use their interests. So that's a level two. You want the kids to not only show you, but also tell you how they did it. The third level is more of a um, think strategically, uh, situational, you have to use evidence and that's similar to shows like uh, Top Chef, or there's a new show out there called Lego Masters. You give them this outcome, give them the answer, and they have to think strategically how and why they can use their knowledge and skills to attain that outcome or defend that outcome or justify that response. Basically, if you think about even shows like The Apprentice, okay, where you're given a task, now you have to use your knowledge and skills to complete that task and come up with something the big thing is this, and the secret behind this is this, is that give the kids the answer and have them explain why or why not that's the answer. You can play a simple game like this. Say, I got 20. That's my product. What are your factors? So if I got 20 and what, that's my product, what two numbers could you multiply to get that? Five and four. Okay, why? Because five times four is 20. And? And you asked me for factors. Right, but also can't four times five equal to 20? Yeah. Okay. Oh, so you want me to give them all? Yeah, so that's what the thing, and I just did that actually in an, in an instructional coaching thing with teachers, is that base, and it's really funny because how they explain it is how they understand it. And as long as they can defend, explain, and justify what they're doing, it doesn't matter what the answer is because they're giving you the answer. Mm -hmm. It's about can you explain, justify why that answer is correct or incorrect? Arguments, discussions, that's a level three. Level four is very much the extended learning where basically, and this is, everyone can be doing level fours in, at home because guess what? It takes you behind out of the classroom. You got to go beyond the classroom. You got to go deep within the subject area. You got to go across the curriculum. This is where in education, we call these STEM learning experiences, science, technology, engineering, math, or stream, where we integrate reading and arts. This is basically, you can take the kids and have them go and transfer, use, and share what they're learning in an innovative and an inventive way. Have them go and find, figure out, okay, I'm learning this in school. What's my relevance? You know, one of the things I did with uh, my daughters, I told you, we just got mad in 20 football. And I told her, I said, look at the plays on there. And I said, what if that's a graph? What if your x-axis is your offensive line and your y-axis goes from your quarterback to the end zone? There's the Madden plays. If you look at them, if you know Madden football, you know, they, there's all these lines and they got to go like this. And I say, how could you graph that play? And how could you create football plays using linear equations? Okay. And it's as simple as this. You don't need Madden football. What you can do is you can go find, you know, make a straight line uh, horizontally, make a straight line vertically, put X's on it, draw the lines and say, okay, fine. Now I want you to graph that play. Now, how would you do that? I did that as a math teacher. I did that with my kids in math and they got it. And that's a whole different story about the quarterback that year at the school where I taught calling out linear equations as plays. Um, I like to talk about this fourth level. This is where you're Iron Man. This is where your kids become Iron Man. This is where your kids do something really unique and inventive. 
And this is where your kids can really be creative with what they're doing. And if they sit there and you try to encourage them, they go like this, oh no, or they just sit around. Mm -hmm. A lot of it's because they're not used to the situation. We need patience, we need time, and we need flexibility. Don't have this basically um, authoritarian, directive, fetus attitude towards what they're learning. Look, it can be as simple as this, is that let's say, you know, we're watching Avengers Endgame, all right? And a big scene in Avengers Endgame, and if you haven't seen it, well, it's out there enough for people to see it. It's on Disney Plus and everything, so I'm going to give away a key part. There's a part in it where Captain America picks up Thor's hammer, and that was alluded to back in Avengers Age of Ultron, where they were all trying to pick up Thor's hammer, if you remember the scene, and when Captain America picked it up, it shook a little bit, and Thor was like, well, wait a minute, what's going on here? Because no one can pick up uh, the Thor's hammer except for him. So here's a question you can ask your kids. Could Cap did Captain America, was Captain America only able to pick up the hammer at in Avengers Endgame because he finally became worthy, or could he have always picked up the hammer and he just chose not to because he didn't want Thor to get upset or insecure that, hey, someone else can only lift the hammer that he could? Or did Captain America already become come worthy over time that now he was finally able to lift up the hammer himself? Now, a lot of people might be doing the Dwayne Johnson out there to me going like this. Really? Yes, really. Because you're having the kids think critically. Have the kids study the science behind these stories. If you're watching Armageddon, could it be possible that a, a meteor could hit the earth? My gosh, we are living the movie's contagion and outbreak. Okay, you can have the kids do a compare and contrast about that. There's so many different stories about, you know, what has happened when there's been like a social, uh, environmental, political crisis. You know, was the Hunger Games because that society, there was a giant sickness and basically they uh, then had to go and restructure their society. So what do you think society is going to look like after this? That's the great thing about science fiction. Um, the, and it's also making connections with it. And, and it's funny because we're thinking critically and creatively and we're not even realizing it. I don't know if you saw this, but a lot of people with this whole toilet paper crisis, they're comparing it to the movie um, Demolition Man, which came out in about 1994, 93, 94, with Sylvester Stallone and um, um, Wesley Snipes. It took place in the future where after all this plague and all this uh, horrible stuff. They had to restructure society and we couldn't touch each other. And we actually shook hands like this, like you walked up to someone, you did this and you went like that. I call it a demolition sh handshake. We've all been doing that in my house. And our, and people are joking around because they're saying, um, are we, you know, since there's no toilet paper, should we, you know, start, uh, you know, using the seashells. And if you know the movie, that, that's a funny gag in it. Like, you know, uh, Sylvester Stallone did not know how to use the seashells to seashells to go to the bathroom, and Rob Schneider goes, <laughs> "He doesn't know how to use the seashells." And yeah, so so watch that. You know, there's ways to teach and learn, and there's ways to be flexible about it. You don't have to be an expert in math. You don't have to be an expert in science or social study. You don't have to. You don't even have to. You know, have the deeper you know uh, skills and techniques of reading, writing, and math. We all can think. In school, we teach kids how to think and express their thinking through reading, writing, and math. But we're thinking all the time. We're engaging all the time. We're being creative all the time. You know, teach them what you do for a living. Teach them, you know, did, did what they're learning in school, how is it relevant in your life? Or maybe not. Or, you know, go online if you have the resources. You know, use your phones, use your devices. Use it as a tool for instruction, not a weapon of mass distraction, which is what it has been, unfortunately. Right. Well, I loved the, the creative side because it made me think about my daughter. I've got to share these because I'm so proud of her. She's eight, and she, she was uh, making cooling devices in school, and they were teaching them how to be inventive and create something to cool them down. And she just did this without any sort of instruction. She made her own mask out of hair ties and it can go on and clip on the ear. And she was saying, you know, mom, we could make more of these if I had elastic bands so I don't have to waste my hair ties. And so what level is that? That's a level four. 
Okay. okay. That's the kind of thing that gets you on Shark Tank. Okay. What your daughter is doing is she is taking what she learned in school. She's taking her own innate skills and abilities, her gifts, as we like to call it, and doing something and applying it in the real world. Okay. That right there is awesome. It's innovative because basically what she did, she did it solve the problem. If there's no mass out there and we can't have mass, well, what do I have in my resources to do this? Well, I'm taking my hair ties and I'm taking this solid cloth and I am basically going and basically um, solving a world problem. She can go it out there. She can give it to you and everything. I think the hard part right now, I mean, to do it from a monetary standpoint, because you don't want to, again, monetize and profit crisis. That's what I told her. But wow. And, and she's how old? Eight. Eight. We got to tap into that. Our kids think critically and creatively from the moment they start interacting with people, from the moment that they start communicating with people. You think about a child between the age and two and five. What's the question they always ask? Why? why? Okay. Have our kids ask why again. Have our kids care about the world again to ask why. And then basically you got these resources like your computers here that they can go and look it up and have them get excited about life again. Because, you know, sometimes the secret of school is this. If you think about it, and this is not a great thing about school, a kindergartner comes into school and has two questions. Could a man fly and could a car fly? And for the next 12 years, we teach them why it can't. But then... What you do is, and now you got the opportunity to kids to think critically and creatively like that. You know, that was my question when I went into school when I was a little kid. Could a man fly? Because I was obsessed with superheroes. I love Superman. I love Captain America, um, even though he can't fly. And, you know, could a car fly? Because I thought about the Jetsons and I thought about that. We should be in flying cars actually now. So in fourth grade, I learned about birds that birds could fly not because they had feathers and not because they had wings but because they had hollow bones mm -hmm. and i wondered is that the secret if we hollowed out our bones the marrow in our bones could basically we fly and then you know my teacher's like no we can't you can't do that I'm like okay that shuts it down so then i learn about physics when i'm older and i say okay about what happens when you jump in gravity so then I'm thinking, okay, is it that people really can fly or is it that they can jump really far? Okay. So that's that critical thinking. Get excited. Pay attention to the world. Don't just sit there and please, 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 please don't give our kids packets of worksheets. Because I'm going to quote my uh, colleague, Dr. Marsha Tate, worksheets don't grow dendrites. Okay. Right. It's busy work. Mm -hmm. Do something engaging. Do something entertaining ask your kids well what do you want to learn because that's one of the things i tell teachers is this we teach all the content and then we can ask the personal question so if i'm teaching you about um i'm teaching you about uh edgar Allan poe and i'm teaching everything about edgar Allan poe and i'm saying to you well what do you want to learn about edgar Allan poe now we've learned about some stuff what do you want to learn about edgar Allan poe have them go out and find out and have them teach us that's learning no one expects a parent to teach like a teacher, unless they are a teacher, and that's just a benefit. We expect you to engage with your kids. We expect you to interact with your kids. Ask them questions, engage in the conversation, figure out. And I know the older they are, the harder it is to do that, but get them excited about learning. Say, what do you interest you? You know, probably go like, you know, mom, dad, leave me alone, you know. Then if they say that, back off. But you guys at the standpoint, say at some point, you can't just sit around, you can't just do anything. Engage them. Get them to care. It's not about trivial pursuit anymore. It's about developing and demonstrating deeper knowledge and understanding so you can do something great with it. Absolutely, Eric. So tying this all in together, I just want to address my next episode moving forward. I'm doing it on brain network theory. And we're talking about parts of the brain, how they interact together, and how it's so important that we have rest time in order to get to this creative time. And I just wonder your final thoughts, because we have a lot of rest time. And I'm not talking about, you know, an hour of rest time. I'm talking about every hour to give the kids a break from their learning, whether we're doing this at home or whether this transitions to the classroom. 
What do you think about that break time to allow for the creative process? I think it's essential. I think, you know, our brains need to rest. I think we need to basically sometimes decompress. Um, I think we sometimes need to just kind of, lack of a better word, chill out. Um, I think that's also hard for workaholics. I'm a workaholic. It's very hard for me to, um, you know, sit there and, and Netflix and chill or, but, but then, you know, do something that you enjoy, do something that basically will relax you. It could be exercise. It could be, um, going for a walk. It can be just laying down. It can listen to music, you know, listen to, you know, a calm app, um, learn to play an instrument. One of the things I've been doing um, during this time is teaching myself how to play guitar again. And there's a lot of great resources out there. And, and it's fun. Is it frustrating sometimes? Yeah, when it's frustrating, I'm starting to think about it more and work at it. I put it down because it's not decompressing. We need to let our brains relax. And that's the interesting thing. My wife and I were just talking about this is that a lot of things, the reason why we're struggling at home is because we have so many kids on structured, rigid schedules and you know, you think about it, they go to school and then they're going to go home and then they're going to go and do their homework and then they're going to go to practice. We did dance practice or sports practice and then they come back home and then they go to sleep. Their schedules, they are completely, completely off schedule. And we need to have that time just for rest. Maybe we should all take siestas. Maybe we should bring that into our culture. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, because it is critical for the brain to learn. And I only know how to do that through um, through exercise, like getting away, get, get away from your desk, go exercise, things come up. When I'm hiking, I learn things, things pop into my head. Um, but, you know, just thinking about the kids on an hourly basis, just standing up, doing something different, because I don't want to stick them um, to a computer and say, let's do our, our academic school time, and then they're stuck there for a few hours. I'm thinking of you know, maybe taking a walk outside, get some sunlight, just having a bit of a break in there. And that's not what I'm pushing and promoting out there, that we just gotta get these kids on the computers to learn. Um, you know, we need to have them, it's funny, it's hard to do actually in this, in this day and age of what we call social distancing, um, because we can't go to museums, we can't go, you know, even the parks. I mean, there's some parks that are shutting down because, you know, we can't interact with people, but, just, you know, the real big thing is try to get the kids excited about what it is they're learning. And to tell you the truth, sometimes if you think about it, school in some cases has made learning not an enjoyable experience because of all the pressures on it, because of it, it, it's not, and it's okay to say learning can be fun. It doesn't have to be entertaining, but it can be fun. It can be enjoyable. And I think this is, I think we're about, I think if, if we can do a great thing, we should be hitting, thinking about how we can hit the reset button. You know, we just got canceled all our standardized assessments. And it was even ridiculous to think that even if school started up in a week or two, and this is assessment time, our kids are going to be so focused. Yes, I can't get it, wait to get in there and take my state assessment, especially in some states that the assessment doesn't even factor into anything in terms of where they're going to go into the next grade level or even as a graduation requirement. Our kids have figured that out. Okay. Mm -hmm. We can bring this back. And you know what? Singapore is doing this. When I went to Singapore in November, because a lot of stuff I do is how you address standards and assessments, because that's the universal language of uh, education, how you address standards, because you can have different curriculum and content, but your standards are universal to what you're teaching. That's kind of your finish line on your race. They said to me, we're backing away from standardized-based assessment, and we're trying to focus more on the joy of learning. And that's Singapore, who's one of the leaders in education. That's what we need to figure out. We need to figure out how to tap back into that joy of learning. I'm really hoping, I have a lot of, I'm, I'm, I'm an optimist with this. I'm a glass half full, thanks to my mom, who always said, look at the glass half full, because if you look at the half empty, you're just gonna focus on what's not there. Um, this is really a great time to reset. This is really a great time to really think about what it is we're doing out there. And if you want a good idea for leadership, you really need to know in terms of who your team is, who are your leaders and who are your managers? Who are the people 
who are more task oriented and can handle situations? And who are those critical and creative thinkers who are not just only problem solving, but they're also hypothesizing and thinking about the future? I really hope somewhere somebody is basically looking at it in whatever our political or economic uh, organizations and structures that they're saying, okay, you guys are great managers. I need you to handle this now. You guys are great critical and creative thinkers and leaders. I need you to basically think about the hypotheticals and I need you to make sure that we're prepared when we get out of this mess because we're going to get out of this mess. Okay. It's not the end of the world. You know, it all depends upon how we get out of this mess and when. Wow. Well, Eric, I just want to thank you so much for your thoughts today on transitioning from teaching learning in the classroom to learning at home in a fun and enjoyable manner. I've really taken away some ideas from you that I'm going to implement over here. Um, do you have any other resources that you're working on or anything that you want um, people to contact you for? I know that if anyone wants to reach you, they can email you at eric at maverickeducation.com. But what, what have you got um, in your pocket to offer some help for people if they need it? Well, that's how I'm spending my time right now, trying to think about how I can create some resources and, and, and utilize that. The best thing people can do, again, you said my email, eric, E-R-I-K, at maverick, M-A-V-E-R-I-K, education.com. No season Maverick, no season Eric. They can go to my website at uh, www.maverick, M-A-V-E-R-I-K, education.com. Again, no C's. Um, I'm just going to try to put together some videos. Um, reach out to you know people like you to say, hey, let's have a conversation. Let's put the good word out there. We all got to stick together because you know united we stand, divided we fall. And we all got to come together and we all got to basically handle it now and handle it later. And really, it's not going to be easy, but if we can persevere and we can basically make sure that I like to have a statement. I say this tragedy is temporary and we get to decide when we want the story to end and also how we want the story to end. It could end as a tragedy or it can end happily ever after. I'm choosing the latter. Exactly. And just thinking of where this is going, I hope this creates change moving forward for when we things come back to the new normal. I hope that some learning has taken place and things are improved. That's my vision. Well, if history shows that, if you think about it, you know, after we had the Dark Ages, we had the Renaissance. You know, after the American Revolution, we had uh, the Great American Awakening when it comes to Romanticism, when it comes to, you know, the, the increases in art and increases in literature and increases of thought. Um, for every bad thing that happens in society, and history shows this, there gets to be a reawakening where great things can happen. And I'm telling you, I think we're overdue for it. I think it's been a long time since we had some sort of great renaissance. Let's hope that this is going to be, this is going to be, you know, the outcome of this is going to be a renaissance. And the ones who are going to basically lead that renaissance are our kids. So get them thinking critically, get them thinking creatively, and get them to enjoy what they're learning. Wonderful. Thanks so much, Eric, for your time today. Thanks, Andrew. Thanks for having me on. Thanks for taking the time to let me speak and, and share some great ideas. Hopefully people take it. Absolutely.